Central Library and our Faulkner Gallery. My name is Jen Lemberger and I am a librarian here at the Central Library. And I have the privilege of getting to work on the partnership with the League of Women Voters. Um, this is a partnership we've had for a few years that the library is really excited to have because one of the main bases for the library is providing information. So civic engagement and an informed citizenry is really high on our list. So the League is a great partner for us. And so we really love these civic, civic forums that we have. <coughs> I have two announcements before we go into this evening. You'll find on your chair, there's a program and event feedback form. These are really helpful for the library. So if you have good or bad things to say or helpful hints to say, um, we do read these and take them into account. And it also really gives us a basis for being able to have more events like this and provide that information in a documented way. As well, our calendar is in the back. So if anyone hasn't seen the plethora of events that we have this month, they are back there. Including next week, we have our next civic forum with the League of Women Voters, which is an immigration update. We did one last year on immigration, and so this is you know, bringing us back to talk about what the current state um, looks like in our community. So don't miss that on Wednesday at 6 p.m., same place. So we hope to see you here. Um, and then one last thing is we also have a social justice book club, which might be something of interest for the individuals in this room. We're in the midst of our Santa Barbara Reads. So the two books that we're reading for social justice book club this month are Frankenstein and The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and looking at the parallels between the two. So we encourage everyone to come to that. And that is next Tuesday. We meet the third Tuesday of every month. So you can come to the Social Justice Book Club on Tuesday and then come to the League of Women Voters Forum on Wednesday and just hang out at the library all week. Um, many of you here I know I see quite often, so you do that anyways. Um, so once again, just thank you for being here and we look forward to more events with all of you here. And now to take us into the evening, we have, we'll collect them at the end. So you have to fill them out afterwards, otherwise it's not a feedback form. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll have them in the back. Um, and so to take us into the evening and introduce what we will be talking about tonight, um, I'd like to introduce Susan Horn, the Voter Services Representative from our League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. Thank you all for being here. How's that? Thank you all for being here. It's so great to see the level of interest in our community. So um, the League of Women Voters, of course, is all about promoting voting. And we are a nonpartisan organization. And that means we give um, neutral information. And then we have another side of us, which uh, Vijaya is going to say something about. Can you? Good evening, everyone. My name is Vijaya Jamalamarka. I'm Vice President of Program and Advocacy for our local league. Um, I, I will just give a brief introduction to uh, what we do. We have two sides, as, as uh, Susan said. The forum tonight is nonpartisan, and we give attention to both pros and cons. It's simply educational. This is the voter service side of the League of Women Voters, and uh, we promote voting, uh, and especially informed voting. So if the, the League never promotes or opposes um, candidates. The other side of the League is the advocacy side. The League studies issues extensively and comes to consensus on positions on lots of topics over the years, such as the environment, housing, agriculture, taxes, trade, healthcare, and many more. So some of the current propositions and measures are relevant to the positions that we have taken as a league. So if you'd like to see what the league recommends, uh, the advocacy side, uh, the flyers are on the table to the left over here, where Joni is waving 
in the back. <laughs> um, uh, that's where you can take a flyer or you can go on to our website. So now I'll hand it back to Susan. Thank you, Vijaya. I also wanted to thank, just briefly, Gary Atkins, our sound person, and we'll have mics actually for qu the question and answer after each set of propositions. And um, Sylvia Uribe is our translation, simultaneous translation person, and our video people are TVSB, our community public TV, and you'll be able to see this um, event on our website as well as the Spanish translation on our website. So thank you again for coming and um, I wanted to ask you if, has anybody gotten their voter service information? Oh, I love to see those of you who brought them because you can just mark them up like crazy. We also have um, some note taking handouts for you with the list, the, the number of the propositions with space at the side to write. So please write in your questions and um, any notes, of course, that you want. And ballots, guess when the ballot's going out? Anybody heard? Today, today yes, they're being mailed today, so we should get the official ballots. If you're a vote by mail person, and if you haven't signed up for vote for mail, then you will not get your official ballot until you go to the polling place on November 6th, on the election day. And, um, but, what's in the back of this county thing that will save us if we need, if we need to uh, figure out how to vote? Here's the sample ballot. So mark it up, figure out how you want to vote, and if you go to the polls, take it with you. If you want to vote by mail and you haven't done it by election day, you can take your vote by mail ballot to any polling place and turn it in as well. Okay. Just wanted to mention that we have in the back these I will vote stickers, and I want to urge you to take one or more for yourself because the, the idea behind that is to get out the vote because we have in the primary, ha, have any of you read this? In the primary in June, we had less than half of the registered voters voted. So we just have to get people to actually vote. And in order to do that, this is one of the things that we've come up with is um, to have the I will vote because the research shows that if someone has a friend and they know they vote, they're more likely to vote. So this is for your friends to see and to, we want to make it like the norm, you know, to actually vote. So you're welcome to take as many as you want from the back table. Okay, I'm going to introduce our speakers for the for the night and we have like the pro and the novice. We have Shane Stark, who's a longtime um, attorney and, and working for the government. And we have Christine Bosch, who is a teacher and um, has studied madly up for uh, talking about these issues. And like many of us study, but she's really done it in depth for us. So, and she's, she's gonna be the other side, the other half of the presentation. So Shane is a um, member of the League of, League of Women Voters and he's the president of the Education Fund for them. And he is actually um, been 50 years an attorney for government agencies, including um, many years uh, for the county of Santa Barbara. And Christine was a career as a sp speech pathologist in uh, Veterans Administration, VA hospitals moved to Santa Barbara in 93, and maybe you saw her at um, Casa de Maria. She was the coordinator there, and about, retired about 10 years ago, and she's been very involved in social justice activities since then, or all, all her life, probably. So this is who's going to take it over now. So welcome to Shane and Christine.
First, uh, some, some questions for the audience. Would you please raise your hand if you have already tried to understand the ballot measures on the ballot? Raise your hand, get them up there. So most people here. So can I assume also that most people here basically understand what a ballot measure is and how you go about it. Is that anybody who like doesn't? One person? One person? You got it? Everybody understand? Good. We're going to go right, right to it. One more preliminary question. Uh, actually, not a question, a suggestion and a plea. If you brought soft fruit, if you brought soft fruit with you, Please remember you're in an art gallery. If you're in an art gallery, if you have to throw it, aim it at the screen, not the art, and hopefully not the speakers as, 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 as well. Uh, let me just, before I turn it over to Chris, will you get it? Ah, this is what you need to know. So you might want to take time and jot this down. Uh, I have. Uh, it, uh, it's waning every day, but I have great faith in the intelligence of the American voter. So I would suggest to you that all you really need to cast an informed, measured vote on these complicated, tricky ballot measures is the pros and cons from the State League of Women Voters, which have been carefully worked at should be before you one page for each state prop. These websites here with the voter's edge and the easy voter and the financial analysis from the, leg from the legislative analyst's office. If you see financial information or claims and it's not from the legislative analyst's office, it's advertising, and you should take it with a grain of salt, okay? So what you really know, you can figure pretty much any question you've got by looking at these one-pagers, and you can go deeper in depth if you, if, if, if you need to. Don't change it. I'm, I'm, I'm very flexible here. Uh, Everybody got, the, got them down? We can all go home now. You got the websites down. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's just go over how we're going to proceed. Uh, we're going to pretty much skip the background. We'll come back. We'll come, we'll come back to it. Don't worry. I'll even write it out myself if I can remember. Uh, we're going to go through the state measures first and then do the county measures. We'll probably go fast through the county measures at the end. The state measures, we're gonna divide, well, actually we'll divide the thing into four. The first, we're gonna do the first four state measures, which, are all, which all involve bonds of one sort or another. Then we're gonna talk about two measures that are constitutional amendments that have to do with state taxation, uh, propositions five and six. And after each one of these segments, we'll entertain questions uh, fr from the audience on it. Then we'll do the rest of the state propositions, propositions 7, 8, 10, 11, and 12. Nine's off the ballot while the state Supreme Court has fun with it. Uh, and then we will do uh, the local propositions. We'll probably talk a bit about the two-county redistricting measures and maybe if we have, have time about uh, the city of Santa Barbara charter amendments uh, that are on the ballot. We keep going? Okay, everybody knows that. You know you're supposed to be careful. You know that your ballot, your vote is the last line of defense of democracy. I hope everybody understands that. Please vote carefully, vote calmly, vote deliberately, take your time. There's a difference between ballot measures, which is just like making a law. You really need to be scientific and analytical about it, uh, and, and I should say cynical. You should be skeptical to the point of abject cynicism. The, 
the, the, the great woman voter Lily Tomlin, the great woman voter Lily Tomlin is known for the expression, I try to be cynical, but it's hard to keep up. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it, it, sure, it sure sounds good in, in any event. Please, take, uh, take pride in your vote. Vote with, vote with care and, and again, remember to vote, tell your friends, tell your relations, everything. Okay, taxes, bonds, initiative power, referendum. Incidentally, the initiative, the referendum, and the recall are referred to as the great rights of the voters, and they are, uh, they're in the state constitution. It's not a federal right. Okay, this is it. Let's, uh, let's go. There we go, the affordable housing bond. <laughs> and I'll pull the mic up because I'm a little taller, okay. It is a joy to be here, and it is absolutely true. Shane has expertise in cynicism, and I am the novice that is shocked. And I think maybe I have a lot of sympathy out there for the level of shock that uh, has been true for the last two years almost. Um, I also end up extraordinarily proud of the League of Women Voters. They've always been a part of my voting behavior in the past, but I haven't had the uh, drive <laughs> to explore deeply the materials that they have uh, traditionally uh, made available to voters. And I want to underscore VotersEdge.com. It is a wealth of information and is extraordinarily easy to navigate. Uh, you can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper as your own inclination pushes you. <laughs> it, dot org. I'm sorry, did I? Yes, it's dot org. VotersEdge.org. Uh, there is a Spanish translation for it, and um, there's a menu that lets you explore each of these measures or propositions, and within each of the propositions you can get a great deal of information. The uh, pros and cons that you have, uh, the handout that was made available to you, uh, I would like to emphasize that how to evaluate the ballot propositions. Uh, the thing I appreciate so much about it is it grounds you in your own values, and they are the guides to how you want to vote. But they are important questions that help you tap into what's most important to you. So uh, if you want a little peace of mind as you go about this, uh, review those with each of the propositions, and a proposition will let you know which one um, is most important. And you will sense that right away. The other thing I'd like to encourage you to do, and this comes from experience now, you can become befuddled rapidly with, uh, if you haven't already, <laughs> you've been going through the propositions and so forth. So I would suggest that you have the time, take a calm pace, maybe one proposition a day and decide how is it that you want to deal with it. It may take no more than a cup of coffee in the morning, uh, but it could uh, take you, as it does me, deeper and deeper into trying to understand the issues. So um, those are my encouragements. Let's look at housing background, if I could have the time start now. <laughs> um, all of you know that uh, the average house in California is costly. Uh, it's two and a half times the national average. <clears throat> and the average rent in California is about 50% higher than the national average. About 100,000 houses and apartments are constructed each year. And the state provides assistance with grants and low cost loans for low income individuals. California also receives about $2 billion a year from the federal government to support housing projects. 
And this proposal for, <laughs> all right, where is it? Well, that's what it is. There we go. Yes, $4 billion, thank you. <laughs> that's what I was looking for. Um, in this proposal, uh, the authorization would be for four, take that. Four billion. Four billion dollars. Right. Um, and it, you can see the breakdown there uh, for building and renovation of affordable apartment housing, uh, 1.8 billion, 450 million to support infrastructure, parks, water, sewage, transportation. Another 450 million as a down payment assistance for low and modest income ownership. 300 million for the farm worker rental and owner occupied housing. And then $1 billion in home loans to eligible veterans. The important thing to note with that line is that that will be repaid through the mortgages that are granted to qualifying veterans. So it does not become a tax obligation. Are we gone? So we're up here. Okay, yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, the what the cost? Oh, the estimated cost, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. Let me give you a little rule of thumb on a bond. The total cost of a bond which is payable. 35, 40 years is approximately double the face value of the bond. So if they're issuing $3, million, $3 billion in general obligation bonds, the total cost of that is going to be about $6 billion. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out uh, is that this proposal would provide assistance to approximately 30,000 multiple family and 7,500 farm worker households. So the impact would be substantial. Um, and then it, the loans, they'd expect to be able to grant about 3,000 loans. Uh, supporters say that uh, the state is facing a severe housing crisis and this money will be used to build rehabilitation Re and rehabilitate rental units for lower income persons, for grants to local governments, for construction of new units around public transit stations, and for home loans to the veterans. There is um, a sense in that, oops, I don't have, I don't have Shane here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this bond will result in a one-time boost in housing construction, a blip in supply that will help a very limited number of persons. And for that minimal benefit, taxpayers will be saddled with billions more in debt. I'm moving on. Are you doing the... Okay. This is another authorization, uh, authorizes bonds to fund supportive housing for persons with mental illness. This is not going to be additive to the general budget. It is to authorize a reallocation of funds that were passed um, in 2004, Prop 63, the Mental Health Service Act. And uh, it call, it's funded uh, by what's called the Millionaires Fund or Millionaires Tax. It's 1% income tax on millionaires to fund mental health services. And it's earmarked to support No Place Like Home Act that was passed in 2016. Um, so it's a, it's a pass through, but it's a pass through of funds that have already been authorized by voters, but we have to authorize the pass through, if that makes sense to folks. Oh, yeah? Here's why. Are there any recovering lawyers in the, in the audience? Here's why. Yes, there are, count them, two, count them, two lawsuits concerning whether this particular use of Mental Health Services Act funds, that is to issue bonds to pay for hard brick and mortar supportive services, 
are in fact authorized by the rigid by prop sixty three the original mental health services act to resolve this and ensure that the bonds can be issued this proposition is placed on the ballot by the legislature i think thank you as you said funding is held up in the court Did you? <laughs> I'm trying to get coordinated with you. Oh, okay. Okay, so the proposal, um, can you explain? Um, the uh, Legislative Analyst Office in May of 2018 estimated that 20,000 units will be created, half completed in the next five years. Want to go on to supporters? Wait, supporters, yes. Incidentally, for those of bond fanciers, these are reven considered revenue bonds, not general obligation bonds, as are the other bond measures on the ballot. So, yes, a general obligation bond is paid by us, the taxpayers, from the general funds of the state of California and pledges the full faith, full faith and credit of the state to pay them off. A revenue bond, which does not generally require a vote of the people, a revenue bond is a, a, a similarly it is a bond that pays off. It has a dedicated, specific source of revenue rather than flowing from the general fund. The, in this case, because Prop Two, the the uh, the bonds would be funded from the dedicated revenue stream of the millionaire's tax is considered a revenue bond rather than a general obligation bond. Is that good enough? Ab no, you got to vote on this. I mean, usually you do not vote on a revenue bond if it's unconnected to something else that has been on the ballot because prop the Mental Health Services Act was approved by the voters to deviate from it it has to go back to the voters for approval. You see what uh, the supporters have to say, that this would help alleviate the problem of homelessness that complicates mental illness and provide supportive housing, allowing for coordination of care of individuals who need treatment and stable housing. Okay. So the next one. Okay. Opponents. The opponents. Um, say that spending money on buildings instead of badly needed treatment. Counties already use Prop 63 funds to offer housing to severely mentally ill patients, and the measure does not address restrictive zoning laws that make it difficult to build housing. Okay. We're rolling. We're rolling, okay. Once I get used to having a servant here, I'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, Proposition 3. Anything for service. Right. Uh, it's an $8.9 billion water infrastructure bond. <laughs> uh, on the next slide, I would like you, you to note that, um, where is, I'm missing that information. You want the uses of funds? Um, state water. It's a water infrastructure bond, close to nine billion dollars. Okay, what I was looking for was that in June of 2018, we just passed a 4.1 billion dollar infrastructure bond. That's in the opponent. It's under the situation. It's under the situation. <laughs> okay. Where is it? Oh, there um, it is. Okay, and the state. Okay, there it is. Okay, and the state does have billions of dollars available <coughs> monthly, mostly for water quality supply and infrastructure that was authorized by Prop 1 in 2014. So money is not an issue per se. Mm. However, <laughs> um, I want to go on to. The proposal. Yeah. Um, the this 
Well, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I used to have all of this well organized here. But you can see that uh, the state issue would be, or the proposal is for the state to issue the $8.9 billion in general obligation bonds, uh, mostly as grants to local agencies that must match funds. And the estimated cost is $17.3 uh, billion in repayment over 40 years. Uh, the effect on local government depends on the size of the grant received and matching requirements and likely small net effect for local government and ratepayers. Some pro projects could increase future costs. May I interject for a second? Um, I, people who know me will generally uh, hear me say something to the effect of PowerPoint corrupts content. PowerPoint <laughs> corrupts content. This is an example of that. What it means by some projects could increase future costs is simply that you get a grant for something and then in order to make it work, you have to do a big construction project that increases total costs of your, your jurisdiction. A, a classic example, I think, is desalination plants have that, that sort of effect. That's what that cryptic thing that I had to fit in the slide means. Okay, now the use of Prop 3 bond funds go to watershed lands, water supply and quality, fish and wildlife habitat, dam repairs and upgrades, groundwater cleanup, recharge management, and flood protection. Two things worth noting, one worth noting here. When it says dam repairs, the principal amount of that is going to go to fix the Oroville Dam, which as you may know uh, had a pretty significant spillage. Uh, so that's most of that money is going to go to fix the Oro Oroville Dam. Uh, the other thing is of some controversy is while this money is specifically prohibited from going directly to the Twin Tunnels Water Fix Project, some money will go to ancillary facilities, I think like the Bryant Canal, that are connected to that, to that project in case you're a, your vote is driven by where you stand on the, on the Twin Tunnels project. And last, uh, for any of you living in seriously overdrafted groundwater basins, there are a few of them in the county, uh, there is money in here uh, that will allow such jurisdictions uh, to uh, do the studies that are necessary to get uh, decent sanitary uh, systems in there. In the ground. Okay, Shane, thank you. The supporters for this? Oh, supporters. Yes. It's hard to get good help around. <laughs> uh, well, they say, well, fund projects to increase water supply from various sources. Will ensure disadvantaged communities can have access to safe drinking water. Uh, watershed re restoration will improve water quality and protect agriculture. And bonds provide the long-term recession, recession proof dedicated streams of cash the state needs to upgrade and update its aging infrastructure. It's supported primarily by wildlife uh, organizations uh, fruit growers, the rice industry, and the dairy um, business. I took a mo an opportunity to look up what uh, were disadvantaged communities in the state of California, uh, and that's defined as a median annual income below $51,000. When I looked at the map for um, California of where that measure applies, it's in the Central Valley from Stockton to Bakersfield. So not surprisingly, that is the most disastrous water situation in the state, and the funds seem to be geared to helping that community. Is that fair? Fair enough. Oh. <laughs> okay, on to Proposition 4. The opponent. Opponent, oops. We need more dams. <laughs> Prop 3 provides no money for new dams. 
and Prop 3 prioritizes recreation and wildlife over farmers. Taxpayers not only footed the bill for big water bonds in the past, but did it again in early June. The state still hasn't spent all the money it borrowed in 2014 with Prop 1. Repayment, repayment will result in raised taxes. Shall we? Prop 4? We can move on. Yes. There's a hand raised. And we've got No, never. We never show rebuttals. Yes. Oh, um, yes. I don't mean to be flipped. Every, most of the ballot measures that are in the book, in your ballot, will have an argument for, an argument against, and a rebuttal to each. So there'll be a total of, of four arguments, two for each side, uh, for most, most ballot measures. I think you'll notice you go through the book that, that some of these measures don't have much opposition. I would like to give you a place that you could check um, the Legislative uh, Analyst Office, which is lao.ca.gov. If you search, quote, water facts and spending, end quotes, you will come to a report that has a subsection about the history and management of water in California. It's fascinating reading. I encourage you to look it up. And lots of graphics. It makes it a lot more fun. <laughs> it's uh, lao.ca.gov. That's the Legislative Analyst Office for the state. I'm looking up water facts and spending. Yeah, I, I think you'll find a really cool California water map on that, on that website. Yeah, it is. It's it a is very, really. very uh, very interesting maps. Should we, look? Should we go on to the children's hospital? On to the children's hospital. Uh, children's hospitals provide special, oh, I'm sorry, Prop 4. <laughs> it authorizes bonds, funding construction at hospitals, providing children's health care. Now the situation. Uh, children's hospitals provide specialized physical and mental health care to infants and children. Most patients receive Medi-Cal. Voters approved $750 million bond in 2004 and $980 million bond in 2008. This funding is expected to be used up this year by 2018. The proposal for the uh, proposition was that the state raise $1.5 billion through general obligation bonds for renovations, expansions, and upgrades at Children's Hospital. 72% of the funds received for private nonprofit hospitals, with 18% going to the University of California acute care centers, and the remaining 10% going to nonprofits caring for children eligible for government programs. The money is managed through a grant funding through Cal Health, <coughs> Cal Health Facilities Financing Authority. This is customary. Um, this is how it's been done since uh, 2004. Is that right? Do I have that year right? Yes, 2004. And uh, it's a replenishment, if you will, or a continuation of this funding into the new uh, cycle. Okay. The, did we want to go over estimated costs? Or? Well, you can yes, you can okay. see it. Um, the state repays 2.9 billion of the original 1.5 billion, and 1.4 billion interest in repaid over 35 years. So the actual repayment is about 80 million over 35 years. Okay. Ready for the argument? Now we're ready for the supporters. The supporters say that Prop 4 will help 2 million sick children yearly and lead to better health outcomes. Previous bonds have been used to add more beds and purchase new technology. Nonprofit children's hospitals depend on Medi-Cal, the state's public insurance program for low-income residents, and often can't afford to invest in changing technology. These bond funds would allow the state health providers to catch up and they are the primary supporters of this bond. Mm -hmm. 
opponents, the bond will need, would need to be repaid, potentially by higher taxes. And we should first look at improving the entire health care system, including reducing costs. Okay. Um, now, I think would be an appropriate time to take questions related to the four bond measures, props one, two, three, and four. Is anybody going to hold a microphone up? Yes. Mm. Uh, wh while, they're, while they're doing that, probably should note one thing about bonds. There is a rule of thumb in the bond industry that a state should, should not, not spend more than 5% of its, of its total general funds on debt. Uh, California is now at about 4%. And if all the bond measures on, on, on the ballot pass, it'll tick it up, I think, to 4.5%. So we won't be above the limit, but this is a pretty hefty increase. I think it's about an 11% increase in the total amount of general obligation bonds. Yeah. Well, now I have a question about the California general election document. And I'm wondering, is this really a legal document in this state? Because as a senior, I feel disenfranchised. I can't understand it. And I spent a lot of time on it. I'm an educated person, but it is not written. It's written by attorneys for attorneys. And I'm sort of very frustrated in the process of voting. I hear you. <laughs> I, I hear you. The answer to your question is yes, it, it's an official document. Uh, I think it comes out of the Secretary of State's office and is probably written mostly by attorneys. The measures themselves, the actual text of the measures, is not only uh, legal, it's mostly statutes, but it's extremely dense. So uh, again, I, I recommend these pros and cons as sort of a way into at least understanding the basics of the measure, the details are, are pretty difficult to get to. So I, you got my empathy, sir. What about a proposition to um, <laughs> a document like this and have it written in plain English? Curiously enough, California already has a plain English requirement which is routinely required, uh, ignored. <laughs> There, there, there is a plain English requirement. There's a, a readability scale that the laws are supposed to comply with, but I don't think it's actually binding to the extent that it prohibits gobbledygook. Good question. I have a question about Proposition 1. Um, it says here that California also receives about $2 billion each year from the federal government to support housing projects. My question is, has that money been spent? Does the state of California spend $2 billion a year to support housing projects? That, that is a very good question. I, do you know the answer? I do, I do not. I do not. I suspect that they spend a large part of it, but I think that the, the inflow of money is greater than the outflow. So I'd be surprised if they had spent it all. Uh, and then the question of whether they diverted any of it is a separate question. And I think to really get a bead on it, you'd have to do some digging uh, to find out uh, how efficient these housing agencies are with your money. Um, you have said that California, uh, you've said that California um, has a 4% debt at the moment in bonds. I had read that our credit rating was very poor. Is that because of 4%? Or, but I, I want to know if our credit rating is poor or if that was not that? a fact. The debt limit, or the, the, the rule of thumb as to how prudent it is to have that much debt is a component, but by no means the determinant of the state's credit rating. 
You could probably look it up directly online if you, if you go to the, the main rating agencies and you can, and probably at the, at the Department of Finance website too, you can determine what the ratings are of the various bonds that, that are issued. Uh, I'd be surprised if the state of California's credit rating was really low, is perilously low. It certainly could be, I, my understanding, can be a lot better as well. But I, I'd urge you to, to dig into the specific issues. Um, if it's a general obligation bonds are probably the safest investment that a person can make, they're guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the state. Uh, so the, you, you can generally tell by the relatively low and relatively low yield that they have. It's around five percent. So I, I I doubt if the, the if the credit rating is in the tank, uh, but you might want to do a little independent investigation on your own. The, the, the two numbers are not the same. Are we done with the bonds? Anybody asleep? <laughs> okay, time to wake up. Okay. And the next category, we're going to talk about two constitutional amendments, uh, one affecting your Proposition 13 rights and the other having to do with the gas tax. So a little bit of controversy. How many people are benefiting from Prop 13 as it is now? Okay, so this is going to have a level of high concern to you. Uh, the first point to be made, as far as I was concerned, because I'm in the same situation, that a vote of no on this proposition uh, remains, the Prop 13 benefits remain unchanged. The purpose of this bond is to expand the benefits more broadly, and that's what we'll go into. So it's, the, word, the key word is portable there. Portable Prop 13 benefits. It changes requirements for certain property owners to transfer their property tax base to replacement property. And it does involve a constitutional amendment and that's one of the cautions that the league puts out as a red flag because once something is changed in the constitution it's very hard to unchange it. Easy to add, hard to take off. So the present situation is that uh, Prop 13 limits the rate and increases of real property tax by local governments, schools, and districts. Property is reassessed on purchase, new construction, or change of ownership. Owners who are age 55 or older or have a severe disability may transfer asset value to a prior home to a replacement home of equal or lesser market value purchased within two years of selling the prior home and be located in the same county as in as the other property or to another county that permits inter-county transfers. This can only be done once. Just keep that in mind. That's what, that is the basic um, portability provision in Proposition 13 now. Mm -hmm. And that would not change, even if this fails, that's not going to change. So let's get to the proposal. Okay, so the proposal is to expand the ability to transfer assets, that asset value to a new home. The market value of a replacement home could be greater or lesser than the prior home depending upon whether you purchased a, a replacement home at a lower assessment or a higher assessment. The transfer value is uh, figured based on a formula and it limits the number, exec of, number of exemptions. The limits, the limits were removed. Right. Ignorant drafting error here. Okay. <laughs> So the, okay, the transfer value of a replacement home is based on a formula. Increasing if a new home is worth more, decreasing if it's worth less, but still less than market value. And it limits the number of exemptions and counties removed. I'm going to need a lawyer's insight okay. into that. I thought it, I understood. Okay. What, what that is meant to say, what that is meant to say is 
the present limits on the number of times you can use that exemption. You can only use it once under current law. Under Proposition 5, that limitation would be removed. You can use it as many times as you can. You still have to do it within two years of selling your house. That, 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 has, not, that has not changed, but that is essentially what that, what that means. And then it's also adding a tax that the a tax benefit to damage damaged or contaminated non-residential property. Right now it's for residential property only and it will expand it to cover non-residential property. Okay. Okay, so now that that's that's just that's how it works. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's the question was, do we know who proposed the proposal? I am reasonably sure it's an initiative. And if, I, if, if I'm not wrong, my uh, colleague is looking this up, I'm pretty sure that the real estate interests, uh, the, the California Association of Realtors, are behind this. They may not have been the specific sponsor. They're certainly supporting it. The reason is they figure it'll result in more sales of homes. That's the, the, uh, the driving force behind this, is to stimulate uh, sales of homes. As you see when we get to the arguments, you can look at this in a couple different ways. I do know that the information is available on um, the voters' um, edge. If you go into the proposition, it lists the sponsors uh, that are on this proposition, as well as the people who are supporting the initiative. Uh, the, the interests of the supporters and opponents in this particular one are pretty clear cut, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the governments are against it, and the real estate industry is supports it. Okay, let, let's wait till we get through this and the next one, and then we can ask a bunch of questions. How's that? Okay, so going to the fiscal impact, uh, the net effect of reducing local revenue by about $100 million a year at first, growing to $1 billion over time. Increased sales would generate transfer taxes in tens of millions of dollars, but county administrative costs would rise by about the same amount. Fiscal impact on schools, the annual reduction in revenue by about $100 million a year, growing to $1 billion. Most losses offset by equivalent increases in state funding, increasing state spending by same amounts. That's because under the state constitution, the state is required to backfill the schools for uh, any any losses they might suffer. They are not uh, exactly required to do the same thing with respect to cities, counties, and special districts. And here again, I would point to <laughs> the voters' edge. Um, the, if you go into Proposition 5 and go down to the bottom to ask for more information and then hit the additional resources link, it will connect you to the California Budget and Policy Center report. Uh, and it's a 27-page report on the fiscal impact. So that gives you an inclination of how complex it's going to get uh, with this particular proposition. Yeah, can we move on? Okay, that's the, that's the, go on. Uh, oh, okay, do we want to do the supporters? That, I, th I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the. Okay, we can come back to this later at right. the end. Okay. Let's do six. Six is somewhat straightforward. <laughs> uh, if this is the gas tax repeal uh, needing voter approval. Uh, eliminates SB1, uh, road repair and transportation funding requires certain fuel taxes and vehicle fees be approved by the electorate. And again, another constitutional amendment could be involved in this. 
So SB1, uh, the 2017 legislature passed that, um, increasing the state transportation funding from 6.6 .6 billion to 12.1 billion. Funds, repairs, funds, repairs, maintenance, transit projects, and infrastructure. SB1 raised gas taxes, diesel fuel taxes, and a new car fee. Proposition 69, approved in June 2018, dedicates this money to transportation purposes. So the voters have approved it and made sure that it was dedicated to transportation costs. Now the proposal is to amend the state constitution to require voter approval of future taxes on fuel and driving privileges and repeals fuel taxes and vehicle fees enacted by SB1. And just for your information, the last time California uh, passed a fuel tax increase, it was in 1990 and went into effect in 1994. So they haven't been profligate in their <laughs> imposition of these taxes. Um, we're estimated fiscal impact. Uh, SB1 funds uh, reduced 2018 to 2019 uh, to two billion. So we cut it in half and uh, eliminate it by that time. The funding loss will affect state highways, local streets, roads, and mass transit. Voter approval means likely long-term long impacts from difficulty increasing fuel taxes. I would like to cite, this is in the pros and cons, that in March 2018, the U.S. News and World Report rated California 49th in road quality, 11th in bridge quality, and 46th in commute times among the 50 states. So the transportation needs are great. Okay, so then use of funds. Sure, that, the previous slide just tells you what the taxes are. People hate the car tax, you know? You know why they hate the car tax? Because you can't tell it's a tax and you pay it when you register your car and there's a little squiggly line, the bond says VLF, it's a big number depending on how fancy a car you have. And people say, what the hell is this, a VLF? And then it's a tax, it's a general, the general tax. That's the use of funds. Okay, <laughs> so road maintenance and rehabilitation, uh, gas tax, 50% diesel excise tax, DLF fee that you're talking about and the ZEF fee. There they are. 200 million for counties with approved taxes. 100 million active transportation program. 400 million for state highways and bridge program. And then allocations of two to 25 million in specific programs. With the remaining funds, 50% state highway system and 50% cities and counties. But basically the money is split between local road purposes and state highway projects. Right. There's, there's a car, there's some for mass transit in there too. I don't think a great deal. Okay, and the supporters say that uh, gas taxes are, do we have supporters? Yes. <laughs> Whoa. There we go. Uh, gas taxes Whoa. are too high. Um, fall the hardest on hardworking families and are unnecessary in state with budget surplus. One third of gas tax increase diverted to non-road related pet projects and tax increases that directly affect people's lives are too big for the government and legislature to decide. I, 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 I yeah. think it's appropriate here to end a cautionary note. You're going to see a lot of television commercials about, ignore the television commercials, they have red ink and things falling apart and greedy politicians, depending on which, which side of the thing. <laughs> Read the pros and cons and, and the LA offices and, and, and form a rational opinion about what, whether you think the, the tax should be repealed. And then forget, it's very important, the emphasis is on whether this latest increase should be repealed 
but the meat of this proposal requires future increases in, in gas and fuel taxes to receive a statewide vote of the people. At present, it takes two-thirds of the legislature to raise a state tax, and the people have to vote or get to vote on local taxes. So this would change that and put it in the Constitution. And I would add uh, that in the case of Proposition 6, again, the voter's guide, <laughs> uh, or, um, yeah, uh, go to the proposition and look at who is backing uh, this proposition in support of it, and look who is taking a position of opposition as well. It's quite informative. Okay, shall we? Uh, I think it's time for questions about propositions five and six. Question? Let's get a microphone up there so we can pick it up. There's been a lot of um, information that you've given us, well, I should say there's been a lot of data that you've given us so far. Uh, when we're done with all of this, does the League of Women's Voters have positions on any of these issues? Yes, they do, and if you see uh, the fine folks in the back, they will give you uh, information that will tell you what the League of Voters positions are on, on these various uh, state and local measures. But, yeah. Okay, because we, the reason I'm asking is that so far, um, other than scanning over the one-page summary on each of the issues, I haven't learned anything in the last hour. Uh, what I'm hearing is, be an informed voter, research, look at all of the stuff you're supposed to look at, make your own decision. Ab absolutely. And I understand all of that, but the reason we're here is most of us have tried to read through all of the issues and we've not been able to decipher this and so we're looking for some sort of clarity and say look at who is sponsoring this well a lot of that is very opaque you know look who is benefiting well a lot of that's very opaque and so i think at least for myself the reason i came tonight is to cut to the chase through a lot of this stuff and really find uh, you know, which issues are bad, which are good, uh, where they're coming from, so that I know whether I want to support farmers or if I want to support oil producers or whatever. But I'll go to the back and get the information. Yeah. Hate to dis I hate to disappoint you, sir. There, there is a limit to how, how we operate. We, we try yeah. to tell people basically what the measures do and generally in broad terms what the arguments are uh, for for and against, I you know I, I I'd love to sugarcoat this for you and tell you this is easy, but it's not. I mean, if you really want to know what's going on and and who's giving you facts and who's slinging the bull, you really have to do some work. And and I I don't think there's any way around it. I, 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 I well, I, I would add with this last proposition again, if you go to um, the voters. I don't know why I keep blocking on the name. VotersEdge.org. Look up the proposition, and again, you can go down for more information, and you can get the California Budget and Policy Center uh, information. It's called Should Californians Eliminate Recently Enacted Funding? And it will give you a much more complete picture. It's a six-page document readable, <laughs> as opposed to the 27-page one on rent control. So, some, of these, some of these propositions are more opaque, opaque than others. Unfortunately, with Proposition 6, it's been politic. There's been some significant policy issues involved in this proposition, but there's a way more heat than light uh, that's been shed on it uh, in the campaign. Uh, proposition 3, the park bond, is devilishly complex. I mean, that it's a massive uh, legislation, if you really want to get into it, you, you got to do a sub significant amount of digging. And do check the funding behind the uh, opponents and supporters. That'll shed some light, too, on Proposition 6. 
Okay, I'm going to spring forward. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Can oh, I'm sorry. Me? Was there another question? Yeah. Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. We have a couple questions. If you're hello. On Prop 5, something was mentioned about a change that had to do with damaged property, and then we just slipped right by that, and I wondered what that was. I can answer that, John. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that it, currently a person can receive the benefit of keeping their existing value if their residence has been, I think, destroyed in a disaster. Or contaminated. Or, or contaminated, but it has to be basically rendered uninhabitable. Right. This expands the ability to keep your, your, uh, your assessed value somewhat. I think it extends to property that is damaged, uh, as well as allowing you uh, to expanding the, the valuation portability to commercial property as well as, as residential property. The basic thing is the same, but in terms of eligibility to keep your transfer and the number of times you can use it, it is increased as a result of Proposition 5. That close? If you have if you have damage, it doesn't. You're covered one way and the other way. Is that what I'm understanding? It doesn't make any difference. I believe, and I have to like dive into it. I believe that under Prop that Prop Five expands the ability uh, to keep your value even if your property isn't rendered completely uninhabitable or. Right, right. I, because the whole west side is in the ancient riverbed, and it's, um, you know, liquefaction is a, a phenomena uh, mm -hmm. that just happened in uh, Indonesia. So, you know, it is a it's a it's a relevant and interesting item. No, it's a significant issue, and I I, I hate to tell you, but I dig straight into the text and the, and the LAO analysis it, 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 if you want to get that kind of a fine the detail on it. The, the answer will be in the text. Hello. Hello. I'm Ray. Uh, I'm wondering, the slides that you've uh, shown tonight, will they be online somewhere that we can review them later? It, it's theoretically possible. I suppose we could, we could make the PowerPoint available and put it on the League website if our a web mistress uh, would be willing to do it. I mean, there's no reason why she wouldn't be. Thank you. Are we going? Are we good? So, we're, back, we're back, on to, back the, to my pun. You got a pun? Well, I want to spring forward so we can fall back. Ooh, good one. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I'm going to make this very, very short. Um, I don't essentially, this proposition is suggesting that uh, California go on permanent daylight savings time. The state, <laughs> the state has always had the possibility of declaring uh, year-round standard time, and you have the right to appeal and organize and try to persuade the state to do that. If you want year-round daylight savings time, that has to first go to the state, be voted on by our legislation, our legislature, it, by two-thirds. Then it has to go to Congress, and it has to pass Congress, and then it has to be signed by the president. So you decide for yourselves <laughs> how important year-round daylight savings time is and the loops and hoops that you have to uh, go through, or uh, how much you want standard time to be passed by just the state of California, or how much you want things to just stay the same. <laughs> I, this actually, um, it's on the ballot because the voters approved the current situation in 1949, so to change it, you have, you have to go back to the voters. It actually adds a two-thirds requirement, men's the government code. It adds the two-thirds vote requirement, plus a asking uh, the legislature to implore uh, Congress and the president to 
uh, let us do it. Should we uh, rock on? Yes. Prop 8. This is a difficult one. <laughs> oh, I was just going to skip over that. Do you want to know what supporters have to say about <laughs> uh, Okay, for um, year-round um, daylight savings time, studies indicate that clock switching increases traffic accidents, heart attacks, workplace accidents, and other hazards as people struggle to adapt to the disruption of their sleep schedules. All year daylight savings time saves energy. Changing clocks twice a year increases electricity use by 4%, increases full use, fuel use, and costs $434 million. I'm assuming per annum. Mm -hmm. Opponents say the U.S. tried year-round daylight savings time in 1974 during the energy crisis. People hated getting up in the dark in the morning. No conclusive study shows year-round daylight savings time saves energy or money. I would point out that there are some of us who hate getting up in the morning irrespective of whether it's light, <laughs> light or dark. I knew there simply was a, it's a general I principle. <laughs> Should we go on to Prop 8? Okay, this is a heavy one. <laughs> um, Prop 8 is dial dialysis clinic profit limit. Uh, people with end stage, I want to move to this, Whoa. the situation. Uh, people with end stage kidney disease need dialysis to survive and the lives of patients on dialysis can be extended for years. I've added that. Uh, there are 588 licensed dialysis clinics operating in California, serving about eight, 800,000 Californians. So you may very well know a person who's on dialysis. Uh, you may sometime end up on dialysis. Once it begins, it can't end. It's a decision to die. There are two companies that are, own and operate the majority of the clinics, 72% of them, and are uh, contributors to the opposition to this proposition. The estimated annual revenue they receive is $3 billion. Most dialysis pay is okay. Now the proposal is that uh, would require outpatient dialysis clinics to rebate to private insurers any revenues more than 50% higher than qualifying business costs, direct care and quality improvement. Uh, that 15% number is the revenue uh, cap model that is used with the Affordable Care Act and it's the medical loss ratio that uh, says that insurance has to cover 80% of the cost of medical care and their profit margin then is 15%. The text of the proposition says that the revenue cap being sought uh, will be equal to 115% of specified direct patient care services and costs and health care quality improvement. So it's a substantial change that they're seeking. Estimated costs depend on the response of clinics and um, dialysis. I don't know what DPH is. Department of Public Health, yeah, which is you. the I did state know. agency that yes. regulates <laughs> these, these institutions. All these letters, Department of Public Health and court interpretations of allowable costs. Estimate of costs and savings to state and local government will vary. And here is where I would refer you to the uh, official voter information guide, uh, page 51 which spells out many of the uncertainties in this bill in this regard. Okay, and the supporters um, says this would provide incentives for dialysis clinic companies to lower costs and improve the quality of patient care. When insurance companies are charged less for dialysis, the overall cost of insurance will decrease for everyone. And the opponents to this bill, keeping the cap at 15%, um, 
It says that uh, Prop 8 sets arbitrary limits on insurance payments and will not cover the complete cost of running a clinic. Clinics will reduce operations or close, depriving patients of access and increasing risk of poor outcomes. Shall we move on? Uh, visual coming up. <laughs> we're, we, uh, that's off the ballot, the three California measures. You can see where, uh, where we are, just us in Los Angeles, nestled in our, our little coastal enclave. But uh, the, the court, the Supreme Court, is deciding whether this particular proposition to split the state in three is an unlawful revision of the Constitution rather than a legitimate initiative. Lots of fun for constitutional lawyers but we will move past that. I have, incidentally, uh, I, I, have a, I have a limited supply of State of Jefferson t-shirts for those of you who are feeling particularly <laughs> rebellious. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can tell your liberal friends it, it, it relates to Thomas Jefferson rather than what it actually relates to. <laughs> okay. All right. Now a real issue, uh, or a real easy issue, right? Uh, Prop 10 expands local government authority to enact rent control on residential property. Okay. The basics. Uh, cities and counties may limit rents to correct disruption of residential rental markets, maintain safe and habitable housing stock, and promote maintenance in shortages. Ordinance must afford property owners due process of law, notice and hearing, and a fair return on property, avoid taking. Ordinance commonly includes such causes for eviction, relocation, mediation of disputes, and costs may be covered by fees, which is the subject of Prop 26, but it don't have details on that. The expert, as usual, is Shane, but I would also point to your official voter information guide, page 59, for some very helpful information. I, th I think it is most useful in looking at this proposition to first focus on what this does not do. What, what this does not do is change the basic dynamics of rent control as the concept has been developed over, over the years. What it does do is specifically is repeal one of the statutes that the legislature passed to limit local rent control. So this basically expands local options uh, to uh, adopt rent control in one fashion or another uh, depending on their uh, particular uh, situations in the, in the community. Uh, the name of the act that is repealed by Proposition 10 is the Costa Hawkins Act, passed in 1995, I believe. It has two main features which Prop 10 would uh, eliminate. One is a prohibition on rent control on single family homes, homes built after uh, basically 1995. So, no new buildings. No single family homes, no condos. No, and that, under Costa Hawkins, you cannot impose rent control. A city or a county can't impose rent control on it. This lifts that restriction. The second thing that is lifted by Proposition 10 is the current prohibition or the current affirmative requirement that any rent control ordinance allow rents to be raised upon a unit becoming vacant, called vacancy decontrol. Under this, a local city or county would have the option of what kind of rent control it would, it would uh, adopt, whether it would adopt rent control, what buildings it would cover. I will tell you that it would, it is, there are only a few jurisdictions, uh, even before Costa Hawkins was, was passed, that uh, did not allow rents to go up upon vacancies, as some of them do. It's considerably more effective in terms of depressing the rent uh, than vacancy fee control. On the other hand, it's a lot harder to administer. Uh, 
it does, oh, the other thing is important for discount, it doesn't affect mobile homes. Mobile homes are governed by a, a separate set of, of, of laws, uh, and it, this wouldn't be affected at all. It applies to residential rent control. Okay, so this proposal then repeals the Costa Hawkins statewide limits and allows cities and counties to adopt new limits on market rents or expand existing rent controls, any building type or age. It does not impose rent control on any jurisdiction. It does not change existing laws that create rent, uh, create rent control laws and retains landlords' rights to a fair return on investment. The fiscal effects are difficult to predict. Estimated loss of tax revenue statewide could be tens of hundreds of millions of dollars. The supporters point out the high cost of rents that hurt seniors, families, and people of low and fixed income. This proposition will protect them. Prop 10 will allow local communities to decide what makes sense for their rental housing issues. And this crisis that needs an immediate solution, even as lawmakers work on a longer term fix. And I have to stop with <laughs> those who support it. Oh dear. Oh, no opponents. <laughs> uh, rent control, control laws reduce the amount of available property because landlords will stop renting and discourages building allows new local bureaucracies with broad regulatory power. Can we uh, move on to Prop 11? And on to Prop 11. Okay. How are you all doing? <laughs> Overwhelmed yet? Okay. Uh, this is another proposition that I would like to just kind of skip over lightly. Uh, and Shane, correct me, um, with the legal aspects of it. But essentially what it is wanting to do, um, paramedic break time, oops, go back to that. Uh, paramedic break time requires private sector ambulance employees to remain on call during work breaks. Uh, at the present time, labor laws governing EMS services, emergency medical services, and labor laws governing uh, emergency ambulance services don't agree. And this proposition would bring it into agreement and people who are called upon uh, to provide emergency ambulance services uh, would be paid and be on call during their breaks and during their lunches. So they would have to respond even though they uh, are on break. That's not true for emer emergency medical services. This is the, the reason for this proposition is because the law that governs private emergency services workers is the labor code and the Supreme Court says that you have a break under the labor code. It has to be a real break and you can't be on call that provision does not apply to public employees like firefighters. So there's a, a difference, and because uh, emergency medical services require minimum staffing and geographical coverage, you have to have a certain amount of people that are constantly on call. You can see where this creates some operational difficulties if the two aren't reconciled. And I believe it also for uh, American for emergency ambulance services, it uh, creates a possible liability issue. Well, yes, it's all about liability. Well, it's not <laughs> all about liability. One would hope that the public safety would be considered uh, as well as liability, but there is no doubt uh, that there is a heavy finish, uh, fiscal uh, component to this. The uh, service that is used here in Santa Barbara County is AMR, and uh, they p provide emergency transport services for us. They employ about 125 paramedics and uh, emergency medical technicians and handle 35 
34,000 calls annually, according to their website. So that's the service that uh, would be impacted with this proposition. Shall we roll on? Yeah. There, there, there's no opposition that was filed uh, right. to, to, the, to, to this measure. And you could basically look at this pretty much as a cleanup measure. Right. We get to 12. Okay, this is the last one, and <laughs> um, California has already passed laws uh, on the healthy shall we go to situations. <laughs> That's the legislature up there. Right there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the assembly. I think that's the <laughs> but California had uh, already passed this, but the law itself had not been particularly detailed, and it was causing a lot of um, uncertainty and conflict uh, because of the lack of uh, detail and uh, standards. So this bill, or this proposition, is to correct that and to be very specific in uh, the new standards for confinement for farm animals and also uh, the ban of sales of some of the non-complying products. The, the present law is a pretty good example of a, quali a qualitative standard. To, the, the confinement has to be cruelty free in essence. But with the qualitative standard came a pretty much total lack of enforcement. So you have a, an ambiguous uh, measure uh, with a lack of clarity about how to go about enforcing it. So it's, it's not a healthy situation. The proposal is to substitute quantifiable, measurable uh, standard for these various types uh, of uh, animals. Mm -hmm. And the basic debate um, that's going on is that uh, on the opponent side is that this proposition isn't restrictive enough and there are others who want to go even further than what the people who are saying this isn't restrictive enough, they want to go even further and say, and we need more. So there's a, a tension between uh, the opponents uh, to this. There, there is also an ongoing legal dispute about the extent to which the state of California can impose its will on folks from out of state that, that are uh, selling products or buying products across state lines. And there isn't enough time in the world to discuss the Commerce Clause. So we'll <laughs> Shall we? Okay, local issues. Okay. Oh, shall we? Let's, let's get questions. Any questions on 7, 8, 10, 11, and 12? Yes. Guys, I get a microphone over there so you can. There you go. Yeah, I was just wondering about um, on Proposition 10, uh, the opponents are saying that um, it would uh, encourage uh, landlords to reduce their uh, rental availability. And I'm wondering um, how that could happen. I mean, what would the landlords do if they didn't rent out their units? And, I mean, it seems like that would be a moot uh, point. It's a fascinating question. Basically speaking, what tends to happen in a rent-controlled environment is that the landlords, most landlords, not all landlords, you can't generalize about property owners. Most property owners will maintain their property to habitable conditions, but they will not do anything extra because it doesn't pay because their rent, the profit that they make is capped. So there's a sort of a disincentive to improve your unit. The present law, which I will point out, is not changed by Proposition 10. 
guarantees the right of a landlord to evict their tenants if they want to leave the landlord business entirely. They have a right to go out of business. Typically, though, most rent control ordinances, and also some jurisdictions that don't have rent control ordinances, will have just cause eviction ordinances that will limit the landlord's right to evict their tenants to specific causes, non-payment of rent, uh, you know, disorderly conduct and things like that. Uh, generally speaking, if they know, if you, if you know what the rent is and the maximum rent is, you won't have a particular uh, incentive to, to vacate your unit, assuming you have a, uh, have a good tenant. But there, uh, there's definitely a property owner adverse reaction to rent control. They, they, they don't like it. And, you can understand why. But is that close enough of an answer? Close. Any other any other questions? Cool. Should we do the local <gasps> measures? We have time. Yes. Ooh. Well, we'll slip over these. Well, when I, when the web mistress puts this on the website, you can look all these interesting slides that tell you what our local, our state and local taxes are. And you'll notice all these number of things were passed by the voter. And, uh, they didn't do it to make things easy. Okay. Here's your local taxes. This is what we have now. Sales tax, parcel taxes, special taxes. In, Sa in Santa Barbara County this year, See what we got? We have, yay, three school bonds, actually two school bonds and a parcel tax. You'll notice that the, the, a bond for school facilities can be passed with a 55% vote, whereas a special tax, including taxes used to fund school programs, require a two-thirds vote. So that's what you got up there. Uh, we'll get to the redistricting and the charter amendments in a second. You'll notice also on the ballot, I'll take them in one fell swoop, there are a bunch of general taxes. In Santa Maria and Carpinteria, they're basically just straight up local sales taxes can be spent for any, any legitimate public purpose. And Goleta, Lompoc, and Solvang all have cannabis taxes of one, uh, one sort or another. There's a slide in there, and you'll notice they're all different. Kind of interesting. Uh, two measures I'd like to talk about. Three, but who counts? County redistricting. You should have a two-page handout uh, from the League of Women Voters, uh, the, the League, the State League, notably, was a major proponent of the concept of independent redistricting commissions. Uh, we were a, uh, we were a sponsor. We, the League of Women Voters, was a sponsor of the legislation that enables county independent redistricting commissions, and we generally support uh, the particular concept. This is what you have to do every 10 years. You've probably heard the expression, one person, one vote. That's the basic standard uh, for democracy. Every, every person's vote is as good as the next. The exception is where it's necessary to deviate from that to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which ensures that members of protected communities, basically racial minorities and language minorities, uh, have a fair opportunity uh, to cast votes and to have representatives elected to local legislatures. There's also a, a, a state voting rights act that it applies to at-large jurisdictions, not to districts. So four things they can consider, topography, geography, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they are in our redistricting, our local redistricting laws, they're made mandatory criteria, they're common. Uh, all jurisdictions do this. Happens every 10 years. 
I will tell you, I've worked for local government most of the time. I've been employed uh, since I was a shoeshine boy in Philadelphia, which is a long time ago. I have never seen a happier bunch of supervisors as the County Board of Supervisors putting this on the ballot so they didn't have to draw the lines themselves. Uh, the result is there are two, count them, two measures uh, that are on the county-wide ballot, so everybody who lives in the county gets to vote on it, uh, that have to do with redistricting commissions. That's why we did a, that's a Mesa rat in case you, you, you didn't recognize. <laughs> yeah, district two. Uh, basically speaking, they have to be transparent. You have to have a number of hearings. Uh, you can't, this is the tricky part. The state law says that not all the independent commissioners can be members of the same political party. Then they're banned on incumbents in running for offices, etc. We have, yes, two, count them, two measures, measure G and measure H. Measure H is a citizen initiative. It provides for a five-person commission one in each supervisorial district with an alternate for each district, same district, same political affiliation. The rule there is a majority of members cannot be all of the same political party. And it takes a majority vote of the commission to draw the line. So what you have, three people out of five, the alternates don't vote unless the member takes a powder. The, Three people out of five can draw your map. Measure G was put on the ballot by the County Board of Supervisors, who I believe uh, felt uh, that the initiative uh, wasn't expansive enough and, and the membership was too restrictive. Measure G, critically enough, uh, provides for an 11-person commission, the first five of which are essentially uh, picked uh, by this county elections official putting silos, one for each district, drawn it at, by lot by the district attorney. And those five people, they pick the remaining six commissioners. So there's, a, there's 11 people. First five pick the last six, and it's the same basic, same basic deal. They're supposed to represent the diversity uh, of county uh, and you know, different political affiliations and stuff like that. That is the major difference between the two initiatives. There are a lot of little differences. There's a difference in how many hearings there are, uh, the different specific disqualifications that are approved, but the big thing, how many people does it take to vote? Seven out of 11 versus three out of five. That's the major uh, the basic um, let's uh, roll on. Two interesting city charter amendments, city charter, Santa Barbara city charter. Uh, cities, as you may or may not know, have a plenary right to choose their, how they choose their own uh, representatives. Uh, measure B switches us to even year elections. Uh, and it does that by extending the term by one year, basically, of the present members of the council. Okay, you can see that one, two, and three, uh, next November, they'll get five-year terms, four, five, and six, on the 21st, uh, 2021, they get five-year terms, as does the mayor, and after that, everybody will have a four-year term that starts in an even-numbered year. That's what that does. There is a strange statute. Many statutes are strange, but this is a particularly strange one uh, that says that you have to have uh, even year elections if you have significantly less voter participation uh, in odd number year elections than, than you, I think it's the average. We, we trigger that by, by a our odd year election triggers that by a good number. There's a pretty good argument that this statute doesn't apply to charter cities, but the courts can figure that 
force can figure out. That's what that does. Measure C, measure C is a little bit tricky. Uh, what it intends to do is place the court settlement that provided for district elections in the city of Santa Barbara, basically ratify it in the city charter and provide for how vacancies are filled uh, when they occur in a district council seat. And basically, they have to have an election as soon as possible. Uh, they can, the council can appoint uh, an interim uh, person to the seat until the, the election can be called, but they can't call themselves an incumbent. That's what that does. What's important to know, if you vote yes on, on this, you not only acknowledge the district elections, but you provide how, for the, how the vacancies are filled by special election. If you vote no, the council will continue to fill vacancies as under the existing city charter, but the settlement agreement is not going to change. There's still going to be district elections that possibly were good to bear in mind. And I think, oh, Goleta. Anybody live in Goleta here? Not me. You get to vote for how much your mayor and council get paid. My understanding is they had something called, I can barely get the words out of my mouth, Citizens Engagement Commission. There's a citizen <coughs> engagement to say who they're engaged to. Uh, in any event, they came up with this formula, which increases fairly significantly, but not extravagantly, the, sa the salary of the mayor and city council. 75% uh, of the median, medium income for council, 90% for mayor, uh, and they recommended that straightforward. They're not going to do anything about that shopping center across from the Costco. <laughs> they could have a, a blindingly ugly tax or something. Uh, last, last, just run through the, the school bonds and the partial taxes. You'll get a school bond sooner or later in, in, in your life if you own property. Read the plan. That's my advice to people voting on school bonds. Look at what they say they're going to do with the money and see if it makes sense to you. Last, uh, general taxes, cannabis taxes. Interesting. Lompoc doesn't te te test medical sales. Saul Vang does. I don't know what Kalita does. Okay? Everybody, we're we good? Make sure you register and correctly. <laughs> Make sure you vote. Tell your parents to vote. Tell your grandkids to vote. Don't forget to do it. Yeah.